Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. Listening to today's interview, I kept going back and forth, thinking about how different people can be across the world, but also how similar. The book is The Rise and Fall of the East by MIT global econ professor Yasheng Huang, and it's about the shaky status of China's economy right now and how it got there. And yes, China's situation is radically different from that of the United States. But in this conversation with here and now Scott Tong, they talked about not being able to afford property, people unwilling to spend due to economic uncertainty, and a leadership disconnected from its citizens, which to me sounds pretty familiar. That's after the break. This message comes from Apple Card. Earn up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase, every day. Then grow it at 4.50% annual percentage yield when you open a savings account with Apple Card. Visit apple.co slash card calculator to see how much you can earn. Apple Card is subject to credit approval. Savings available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. China has been showing signs of an economic slump. The real estate market, long an important engine for the Chinese economy, has been sputtering. Stock market has been sliding and unemployment is reaching new heights. For some perspective on what's happening now, in a longer view, we turn to Yasheng Huang. He's professor of global economics at MIT, a fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington. And his book is The Rise and Fall of the East, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought China Success and Why They Might Lead to Its Decline. Professor Huang, nice to talk to you again. Nice talking to you, Scott. Let's talk about the Chinese economy now. The property sector is a driver of wealth for so many regular people. You know, my cousin, born and raised in Shanghai, he works for General Motors there. You know, he says it is always economic priority number one, two, three, and four for young people, for young professionals. And then he says he will never, ever be able to afford it because it's so expensive. Why, in your view, is the property sector slumping and why does it matter? It matters tremendously. The property sector accounts for 30% of the Chinese GDP. And when that sector is not doing very well, the overall GDP growth is going to slow as well. The reason why the Chinese economy faces this problem is for the past 20 years, the government has over-invested in cities, in infrastructure, and they have underinvested in people. And if you don't invest in people, if Mm -hmm. their income is not growing, they are not going to be able to consume the products and real estate projects that you create, and that becomes a drag on the economic growth. And speaking of consumers, I mean, we're seeing the stock market falling, but consumer prices have been falling, which may sound good, but it means people do not have the confidence to spend. So it's a sign that sentiment may be bad. Do you see broader warning signs for the Chinese economy? Well, the stock market as an economic engine is not a big part of the Chinese economy, but it is an accurate reflection of the psychology of the Chinese public. And that psychology now is very pessimistic. If you're not optimistic about the future, you don't invest as an investor and you don't consume Mm -hmm. as a consumer. And for Americans, how does that matter? Well, it matters in sort of two opposite ways. For the U.S. companies that want to sell into China, they're going to be faced with some headwinds, right? Because the prices are not rising, there's deflation, But for the U.S. importers, there's going to be a very large supply of the Chinese goods and maybe services populating the global markets as a result of this gap between production and consumption. So we better be prepared for a flood of Chinese goods. Your book, Professor Huang, takes a a long look at Chinese society who has run it over time, how well people have lived or not. And you connect today's China under the Communist Party with the dynasty going back, my goodness, all the way to the 7th century. And what connects them, you argue, 
is a standardized examination system. You're, you say China pioneered the standardized test. <laughs> uh, to help us kind of understand this connection, first of all, for the longest time, what was on the test? Well, the thing that was on the test is one ideology, Confucianist ideology, because there was only one ideology on the exam, other ideologies died out because there was mm. no other way to transmit other ideologies. It also prevented new uh, alternative ideas from emerging. So I use that way of looking at Chinese history to explain why autocracy became so strong, so durable, and so long-lasting in Chinese history. You know, as part of my own family history research, we found genealogies on each side of the family, and they would emphasize which men did well on the civil service examination. Uh, <laughs> that was part of the family legacy. It was my great-grandfather's ticket out of the teeny tiny Tong village, you know, in the 19th century. In general, I guess there are two sides of this, you argue. One is what was good or perhaps stable for society. Help us understand that side of the ledger, as it were. China achieved peace and stability, and that was in part because of the exam. The exam was unifying the country, consolidated the rule of the emperors, prevented different ideologies and different religions from emerging. Mm -hmm. But the downside was the society became stagnant, less inventive, less dynamic. Is there a, an optimistic side of the argument that is there is increasing top-down controls, as you described, coming from the central government in Beijing. But down in the provinces, there is a lot of space for the private economy, for competition, for entrepreneurs at some level to try new things. Yeah, you, you are absolutely right. The political system is authoritarian and autocratic. But for a long period of time, between 1978 and 2018, the Chinese system was quite decentralized in terms of its economic management. Local governments called the shops, right? The central government was more of a caretaker. But the problem is, under the current uh, leader, Xi Jinping, the political system and the economic system have to become more centralized. And that centralization has really dampened the incentive of the private entrepreneurs, local government officials to develop the economy. Unless they reverse that, it is very difficult for them to get back to the economic growth that they were accustomed to before. You've talked about the civil service examination system. 1905, Imperial China got rid of that test, right? decided it was too stodgy. And right around that time, there was so much happening. You know, my own family, my grandmother was born. Her feet were unbound. There was all this diversity of thought. My great-grandfather was part of this underground society, you know, called the Revolutionary Alliance. There was this great flourishing for a little bit of thought and open debate. Could that return? Well, in the very long run, I think that could happen. But the problem is that we don't really think about economic issues in the very, very long run. So if we're talking about two to three decades, these policy mistakes can be extremely costly because they are going to contribute to the economic stagnation. So in yeah. that sense, it is very important for the Chinese leadership to recognize that the reason why China was able to grow was because of economic reforms, political decentralization, and growing space for society, for media, and critically, globalization and a pragmatic working relationship with the West. So the mm -hmm. current leadership has to recognize that reality in order to improve their economy and get back to the policies that uh, they had before Xi Jinping. I, I wonder how your, your thoughts are received. 
Yeah, there have always been different ideas and debates about the virtue of diversity vis-a-vis one-party system, democracy vis-a-vis autocracy. I think the discussion is shifting toward the view China really needs to reform its system in order to move forward. And the economy is not improving. This is a waking moment for many of the Chinese who benefited from economic Mm. reforms in the past. But now they see that the single-party system is actually destroying the economy. They start to believe that maybe we should do something about the single-party leadership. We've been talking to Yasheng Huang. He's fellow at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. and professor of global economics at MIT. His recent book is The Rise and Fall of the East. Professor Huang, thanks for your time. Thank you, Scott. It's a pleasure talking to you. What does it mean to be black in America? In NPR's Black Stories, Black Truths, a collection of stories as varied, nuanced, and dynamic as black experiences, you'll hear it means everything. Search NPR Black Stories, Black Truths wherever you get your podcasts. Support for this podcast and the following message come from South Carolina Federal Credit Union, a member-owned financial institution serving six major markets across South Carolina. Their warm, welcoming, and friendly staff are eager to help you turn your financial dreams into a reality. South Carolina Federal Credit Union invites you to become part of their family today. Learn more at scfederal.org, insured by NCUA.